it's real. Highlights. Final meeting. Good, good evening, everybody. I'd like to call the meeting to order and welcome you to the regular meeting of the Milwaukee Planning Commission. Agendas and additional copies of staff reports are available on the city website at www.milwaukeeoregon.gov. You may locate them by navigating to the community calendar where tonight's meeting page is posted. If you have not reviewed the agenda, please do so. It contains important information about the process. Um, I'd now like to move into the first order of business, which is our native land acknowledgements. The city of Milwaukee respectfully acknowledges that our community is located on the ancestral homeland of the Clackamas people. In 1885, the surviving members of the Clackamas signed the Willamette Treaty, also known as the Kalapuya Treaty, with the federal government in good faith. We offer our respect and gratitude to the indigenous people of this land. And I think as some of my uh, fellow planning commissioners know, this is kind of a topic of, of personal interest to me in terms of Native American history and research. And we just encourage you, and I think I've shared it with Commissioner Hemer before, uh, we have a huge resource in, in our community. Dr. David G. Lewis, he's an anthropologist at Oregon State University who's done a lot of research on the history of the Native American tribes like in the Willamette Valley. So uh, you can check out his website, which is IndianHistoryResearch.com. Moving on to the second order of business, um, we have no uh, minutes for consideration this evening. So uh, third item is informational items. Um, are there any informational items from staff? I do just want to let everybody know that apparently um, the meeting tonight is not playing during the live stream on YouTube, oh. but it is being recorded, so it will be there later. So no one who's out there that's not logged on to Zoom can actually see this. So if you know anyone that actually wants to be at this meeting, they'll need to log into the Zoom account. Otherwise, they won't be able to see the meeting. So it's just on Sorry. Oh, it's on the it's cable, on cable channel. And where is the cable channel? Where? Channel 30. So we are live streaming on channel 30. And if any uh, members who are supporting or opposing or being neutral on any of the items tonight have friends or family who aren't here, you could text them and let them know they could tune in on Zoom in real time. Otherwise, they'll have to watch uh, the YouTube recording afterwards. Correct. Awesome. Thank you. Any, anything else? Nothing else? Great, so we'll move on to item four. This is audience participation. Uh, and this is specifically for uh, an opportunity for audience members to comment on any items that aren't on our agenda. So any of the land use hearings we have, as well as our downtown design review, we should hold comment for that. But this is just kind of an open opportunity uh, to speak about any items that aren't on the agenda. Do any audience members wish to comment on an item that's not on the agenda? If folks are participating digitally via Zoom, you can use your raise your hand feature um, to indicate that you wish to make a comment. And for anyone who might be calling into Zoom, you can press star nine to indicate you wish to make a comment. No hands are raised. Okay. We'll then move on to um, item five, which is our Community Involvement Advisory Committee. Um, so in the, at this point in the agenda, the Planning Commission will be acting as the Community Involvement Advisory Committee, which is an advisory committee that the uh, City Council has asked us to also serve in some capacity of. I'm curious if staff have any updates to report on or any of our fellow um, community involvement advisory committee members have items to report on um, or if any community members wish to speak on anything. I do not have anything for the CIAC tonight, um, but I will follow up with some follow up from last year at our next meeting. Okay. Chair, if I may. Yes. So I have the privilege and the honor of working with another organization to go around to each NDA during this time of year. And I just uh, want to thank uh, all the NDA uh, leaders and uh, the people that are attending. Uh, they are actually pretty well attended, uh, somewhere between 15 and 20 people at each meeting. 
Uh, and then uh, that also includes the hybrid with the Zoom. Everybody has figured that out as well. And I just want to thank uh, each and every one of them for uh, participating and uh, being involved uh, in the community. So um, thank you for that. Thanks. Anything else? All right, moving right along. Uh, we'll move to item six, which is our hearing items, um, starting with 6.1, which is the conditional use for a vacation rental in the RMD zone. Um, this is a continuation from our January 10th, 2023 hearing. Um, so the continued public hearing on a request for a conditional use for a vacation rental is called to order. Um, the purpose of this hearing is to continue the commission's consideration of application number CU-2002-006, which is a conditional use request on the property located at 11611 Southeast 33rd Avenue. The applicant has the burden of proving that the application is consistent with the city's zoning and subdivision ordinances, comprehensive plan, any applicable municipal code provisions, and that the proposal conforms with the city's applicable criteria. Um, I now ask uh, staff to cite the zoning ordinance sections where the criteria can be found. Milwaukee Municipal Code, subsection 19.301, moderate density residential zone. Uh, subsection 19.905, conditional uses, and subsection 19.1006, type 3 review. Great. Uh, so all testimony and evidence must be directed towards the applicable substantive criteria. Failure to address a criterion or to raise an issue with sufficient detail to allow the Planning Commission an adequate opportunity to respond to each issue precludes appeal to the City Council based on that issue. Failure to raise any constitutional or other issues related to proposed conditions of approval with sufficient detail to allow a response precludes an action for damages in circuit court. Any party withstanding may appeal the decision of the Planning Commission to the Milwaukee City Council. Persons withstanding are those who submit comments or testify. We will recognize those persons submitting testimony. In submitting testimony, please state your name and city of residence for the record so that it may be officially entered into the minutes. And if you are here to testify, please remember to confine your remarks to the application and to the relevant uh, criteria, as well as to kind of avoid any repetition or information that might not be relevant. Um, as chair, uh, I might interrupt you if disruptions were to kind of occur. Um, if additional documents or evidence are provided by any party, the commission may, if requested, allow a continuance or leave the record open to allow the party's reasonable opportunity to respond. Any such continuance or extension shall be subject to the limitations of the 120 day rule, unless the continuance or extension is requested or agreed to by the applicant. Um, given, I think, some of the interest in the, um, the item, the first item tonight, uh, I'll probably be limiting uh, testimony to three minutes uh, per person. Um, so want to uh, ask uh, about conflicts of interest, if any members of the commission wish to abstain from the hearing? No. no. Hearing none. Um, does any member of the commission wish to declare an actual or a potential conflict of interest? No. No. Hearing none. Does any member of the commission wish to report on any ex parte contacts? No. No. Hearing none. Will any commissioner who has visited the site prior to this hearing please raise their hand? Seeing one. Um, uh, Commissioner Ert, uh, did uh, in your visiting uh, the site, did you speak to anyone at the site or note, it, note anything different from what was indicated in the staff report for the application? No. Great. Um, does any member of the audience wish to challenge the participation of any member of the Planning Commission? Is now a good time to add that I was able to watch the whole video because I wasn't here at the last meeting. Sure, yeah, I think that's uh, worth worth noting. And I will note for the record myself, I was also absent last um, 
last hearing, I've watched the video, reviewed all the materials, um, and I'm caught up to speed on it. So hearing none, uh, does any member of the audience wish to challenge the jurisdiction of the Planning Commission to hear this matter? No? Great. Well, um, let's move forward with the staff report. Evening Chair, members of the Commission. Um, Vera Colius, Senior Planner, here to present the staff report for this land use application for the uh, proposed vacation rental at 11611 Southeast 33rd Avenue. Some of these slides may look familiar um, from the last hearing, but I will just kind of quickly go through them. Um, the site itself um, is outlined here in red slash orange. Um, and uh, the site itself is about 5,000 square feet. It's on the west side of 33rd Avenue. It's developed with a single detached dwelling. Uh, the property and the properties in the immediate uh, vicinity are zoned moderate density residential RMD. Vacation rentals are allowed in all of our residential zones um, as a conditional use. Um, and again, a vacation rental is defined as a housing unit that is rented out um, to a party uh, for no more than 30 days in length, um, but the, there is no primary occupant of, of the property. Okay. So the approval criteria for a new conditional use are found in 19.905. Um, on this list, um, staff has highlighted four of them in sort of orange um, as kind of the key applicable criteria um, for a uh, proposed vacation rental. And I'm going to go through those now. Okay. So the first criteria um, to, uh, to be addressed is the operating and physical characteristics of the use are reasonably compatible with, with nearby uses. Uh, no physical alterations have been proposed to the home other than um, a significant amount of up updating and upgrades and restoration has been done to the property to bring it um, up, to, up to code. Um, and um, as well as sort of the, the proposed use, um, the application materials and the package included the house rules for the vacation rental, um, as well as the um, ITRIP sort of guidelines and what a uh, visitor or a guest in the property, um, the rules for the home. Um, so a maximum of eight guests um, is permitted as part of one of the, the rental parties. All identified impacts will be mitigated to the extent practicable is the, is the next piece of, of criteria. Um, as um, detailed in the application materials, uh, management staff is located nearby uh, the property and uh, professional management is available 24 hours a day um, for the property. Uh, the applicant um, is have or has had uh, decibel meters installed um, to monitor noise levels because quiet, quiet hours are part of uh, those house rules, 10 p.m. to 7 a.m. So there are those decibel meters installed to monitor to make sure that those um, noise levels are um, complied with. The rental agreement includes, again, quiet hours um, that uh, renters or the guests need to be at least 25 years old to be able to, to stay in the, in the vacation rental. The guest number is limited to eight, um, and smoking is prohibited on the property as well. So all of these items as part of sort of the overall package of house rules and how the property will be managed um, have been proposed as part of um, how to mitigate any potential impact impacts um, for it being a vacation rental. All right. And again, the, the, the vacation rental will operate as a residential property while, you know, sort of being considered kind of commercial lodging um, may be sort of kind of the blanket or over um, overarching use. It still will be functioning as a residence. It's not um, commercial operations but will not be happening in the property. It is a residential property. All right. Proposed use will not have unmitigated nuisance impacts greater than those usually generated by um, uses permitted outright. Uses permitted outright in the RMD are residential uses. So we would have parties um, up to eight people staying on in the property as a home, um, as a single detached dwelling. Um, guests are asked to, to park on site. There are four off-street parking spaces um, provided on the property with the, the garage and the driveway. Um, and again, the use of the property remains residential in nature. There won't be commercial activities happening on the site. Um, it is a it's a home, and that's and that's how it how it will be used. 
and that the proposed use is consistent with applicable comprehensive plan policies. The comprehensive plan talks about vacation rentals, specifically in the housing section um, of the plan, um, stating that they would be monitored and any effect um, for any effects on long-term housing. And as we've done in the past um, for recent um, vacation rentals that have been approved, um, by requiring a conditional use and having to go through this process, we have added this review process to ensure that we are doing that, that we are monitoring and tracking uh, vacation rentals. If approved, this vacation rental would be the sixth approved vacation rental in the city. Um, and the, what you can see here um, on the screen, um, again, require, we require the conditional use that allows the city to track and monitor them. So that's in compliance with the comprehensive plan policy. Um, and some information regarding sort of the housing impact or potential impact of vacation rentals. There are a total of 9,627 housing units in the city. Um, this, this data is from the housing capacity analysis that you all heard about a couple of months ago. Um, of those 9,600 and change housing units, there are 6,450 single detached dwellings, so as a housing type. Um, so of those 6,450 detached dwellings, we currently have five vacation rentals that have been approved through this process. So this would be six. So that goes to this idea of kind of the impact of vacation rentals on housing um, within the city. And again, because the comp plan states that it should be regulated and monitored, it assumes that they are allowed. So the code does allow vacation rentals through this process um, to make sure that we are monitoring and tracking um, how they are affecting the housing stock. So again, to date, the city has approved five vacation rentals, um, one most recently in November at Cherrigino Farms, I'm sure you recall. Uh, no complaints um, to staff's knowledge have been received about any of them. Um, and the approval documents, including conditions of approval um, and findings are similar amongst all of them, including the subject um, application, similar if not basically actually exactly the same. The notable exception um, are the additional conditions that were attached to the um, one proposed at Cherrigino Farms, um, which were a response to specific evidence-based complaints because that vacation rental was operating prior to getting approval. So folks in the neighborhood had already sort of experienced what was happening there specifically. Um, there were some issues with um, folks kind of jumping over the fence or coming onto the property or something, right? So signage signage was installed um, and additional landscaping was installed as well as part of the conditions of approval to address those very specific um, complaints that were experienced um, by the neighbors. Otherwise, the code required conditions have been sufficient um, to date for the vacation rentals. Um, and I think it also, given that we're talking about the conference of plan policies, I think it, it it's worth mentioning that vacation rent rentals do provide benefits to the community, considering the city has no motels or hotels or anything like that. Um, so um, they do provide a benefit for um, for sh stays like that um, in the city. Okay. So the recommended conditions of approval, and again, those have been included in your um, in the packet with the staff report. Um, these are spe specified within the conditional use section of the code, 19.905.9.H. So these are the specific um, standards and conditions that are attached to vacation rentals. So prior to initial occupancy, the building official has to verify that building code and fire code standards are satisfied. So that's standard, and that will um, have to happen um, before they can begin operating as the as a vacation rental. Um, when they file um, for their business registration, which is annually, um, they will need to send out a notice to all folks within 300 feet. We can provide that mailing list to them. And that notice will include three key pieces of information, property owner contact information, the um, operator or the property manager contact information. So I know that some of the comments talked about needing to have you know, the contact information. That's a standard condition that's laid out actually in the code and is required, um, as well as the city of, of Milwaukee, uh, the police non-emergency telephone number. So in case, you know, there's there's that number. So if, if there are any issues on the property, these all of this information will be provided to, to folks, uh, again, within 300 feet. Um, and finally, a conditional use is recorded with the county. The city prepares that conditional use that um, attaches this conditional use and this approval to that property, and the applicant would record that um, with, with the county. Um, and I would just note um, that I think there was um, at least one comment that talked about um, having the conditional use need to be reapplied for if there was a change in ownership. The code actually very specifically states that a conditional use is not affected by a change in ownership. So if 
the conditional use goes with the use goes with the property. It doesn't go with the owner. So everything would still stay the same, all the conditions and you know, all of the performance standards for a vacation rental, but a change in ownership does not change that. The conditional use goes with the property, uh, not with the owner. That's in a 19.905.6.D. Uh, 19, and, 905. Point six point D. 6D. Thank yeah. you. And Chair, if I may ask a question at this point. Um, and I want to make sure that uh, when the new owner applies for their business tax, then they are required to send out within the 300 feet with Correct. that would be with all the new information. In the yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Or anytime if uh, if the prior owner right sells the property, I would assume then then that their business tax is no longer valid, right? Because it's right, a new there's owner. There's a change in ownership. So generally there's a new um, business registration is applied for. And every time that a new business registration gets applied for, the information gets That's sent right. out. Okay, yes. thank you. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So since the last um, meeting, we did receive um, some additional comments. Um, and uh, so this summarizes the comments submitted as of the hearing. Um, a couple more have come in this evening, so we can go over those in a second. Um, so some folks did submit um, comments in opposition to the vacation rental. Um, of the comments submitted, um, most do seem directed more towards policy of allowing vacation rentals in the city. Um, and staff would note that issues like crime or something like that, those, those are really more policy questions or the appropriateness of a vacation rental in a neighborhood. Um, those are policy items. Those aren't um, comments directed specifically to the approval criteria. Um, those are the kinds of comments or the kinds of um, issues that should be raised by to city council. Um, and if this is a policy discussion that we should be having as far as allowing vacation rentals in the city, that's the appropriate um, place to be having that discussion, not during um, a land use application process. So we certainly, um, and we can have that discussion um, if that's something that city council wishes to do. Okay. So staff's recommendation has not changed since the since the last hearing. Um, staff recommends approval of the conditional use and adoption of the recommended findings and conditions of approval. Um, as stated earlier, again, the city has five vacation rentals in the city right now. This would be the sixth. Um, and again, most recently was that vacation rental approval at Cherigino Farms um, in November. No complaints have been received um, about any of them. And again, we would just note that the uh, the code that was applied to all of those other five vacation rentals is the same code that is being applied here. Um, and staff doesn't see any notable differences between these applications that would warrant, um, frankly, a different decision uh, for this uh, vacation rental either. Uh, the applicant has provided, um, in our opinion, um, sufficient information showing compliance with the approval criteria um, and the conditions of approval will address those code requirements um, that we just talked about. You have some decision-making options. Um, you could approve the application this evening with recommended find with the recommended findings, conditions of approval. You could approve the application with some modifications to those findings and conditions of approval. We'll need to read those into the record and tie those to the appro approval criteria. You could continue the hearing um, or you could deny the application. Um, we would need new findings um, if that were the case. And the 120 day deadline for the application is April 4th. Happy to answer any questions you might have. I could just add Please. something really quick. Yeah. I just wanted um, everybody in the audience to know that all of the um, testimony has been forwarded to the Planning Commission before yes. this meeting that was received and also copies of the letters that were received this evening were also given to the Planning Commission, just so you all are aware. Yeah, so in, in addition to the testimony that was listed on the slide, we've also received a, a written letter from um, a Miss Linda Gage. Uh, and we've also received a um, written letter from um, a Ms. Marin Kausch. Pardon the pr pronunciation on that. And if I may, through the chair, all of the comments that were submitted up until the hearing um, were posted this morning online on the meeting website. So those were available for public review as well. Thanks. Um, well, um, and open this up for any clarifying questions from staff. And I think um, maybe I'll start um, noting that something like the conditional use um, being tied to the property kind of uh, for the property's existence, 
if if that was something that uh, members of the public or members of this commission were unhappy about, that's really is more of a policy discussion to have with city council about changes that could be made there. Is that it's it's in the code, in the you know, code. that the conditional so, use yeah. is tied that way. So um, that would require a code amendment process. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think that it was maybe one of my one of my own kind of personal clarifying questions and. Um, Maybe it's also just kind of a clarif clarification in terms of on your slides also um, <laughs> noting that a lot of the testimony was in opposition. I think it's also worth noting uh, there's several uh, uh, sentiments in the in the testimony about seeing this property um, no longer be vacant, no longer be overgrown, and um, some of those things. I don't know if there's anything else, like if, if the city has had any code enforcement complaints on, on this property over the years, if staff's aware of that. On this, on on this the subject yeah. property? Um, I'm not aware. That doesn't mean it hasn't happened, sure. but I but yeah. I don't I don't know for sure. No. Great. Any other questions from? Yeah. I just wanted to give maybe by way of explanation a reason why can, uh, a conditional use permit runs with the property. In this particular instance, this is a very minimal, uh, le very low invasiveness type of conditional use. Other conditional uses are ball fields, yeah. parking lots, yeah. things like that. And so when somebody applies for a conditional use and gets approved, they're submitting quite a bit of, of money to build the infrastructure for that. And so there's a, a understanding that that would continue. In this particular instance, it is not a, not a very invasive conditional use. A new purchaser of the property may quite likely not wish to continue as a vacation rental. So it's not forever, uh, potentially, depending on who owns the property. Great. Thanks for that clarification. Sure. <clears throat> Along the same lines, then, what perhaps would be a revocation of the conditional use um, if, if any terms of the conditional use permit uh, were violated. What is there a process in place for that? Yeah, the, the code specifies under what circumstances um, the conditional use would go away. Um, a change in use, so um, loss of use status. So if um, it stops being a vacation rental for, I think it's a year, I'll need to check the code, um, then it doesn't come back, then you would have to, then you would have to reapply, um, as well as um, not complying with the conditions of approval. So their code enforcement, you know, would be part of that process. Um, and then it would, if it went into that code enforcement process, that would, that's how we, they could be revoked at that point. Thanks for that clarification. Yeah, and usually in a situation like that, there's a process set, set out where uh, there would be a complaint issued with the code enforcement department. Code enforcement would go out, go through that entire process. The, the, the property owner would have the ability to bring his use into compliance with the terms of his conditional use permit. Kind of a rolling process where we see what happens. Uh, and at some point, the, if, if, if it's consistently misused and not used in conformance with its permit that, that could potentially be revoked it just has to go down the entire code enforcement process and, and that's a place may I also wanted to kind of follow up on I was I was noting I mean I know we only have five vacation rentals and I'm assuming uh, and and I think it was mentioned in, in your presentation Vera that you know this is very similar to the other ones we've had so I'm assuming the conditions of approval are also very similar and was noting that, um, and I think it was kind of on your slide in terms of the business tax, sending out notification about the property owner contact information, the property manager, police non-emergency. I'm, I'm wondering if it might also make sense to have code enforcement contact information. I don't know if non-emergency is necessarily going to talk to code enforcement, right? You could, I could see a, a potential... Uh, gap there. So I don't know if um, if that's something that's been thought of in, in as, a, as a potential um, additional mm -hmm. condition of approval, if you think that would make sense or not. I think um, at least to the point where, you know, if, you know, if, if the police are contacted about something, if it is a code issue, code enforcement is housed within the police department, oh, oh, actually. So they, okay. they have the so same they, boss. They, so yeah. yes, they're, they're actually in the same department. Code thanks. enforcement is part yeah. of the police department. Yeah. Thanks yeah. for clarifying yeah. that. Yeah. That's, that's useful to kind of know that this, if a complaint came into the police, it would probably end up getting routed. Yeah. Um, okay, great. I don't think they like to get involved in zoning. If I, would imagine, <laughs> I would imagine, I would imagine, 
chief straight has other things he wants to spend his time and his staff's time on. Yeah. Um, are there any other questions from commission? If I may, Chair? Um, I guess so, Commissioner Hamer. Thank you. Um, so oh, we got a very uh, lengthy uh, testimony about ADA compliance, uh, which was a great read. Uh, I guess so my, my question is, is that if it is commercial lodging, do we have anywhere in our code that states that commercial lodging needs to be ADA compliant? Um, not in the zoning code. That would be a building code um, okay. issue. And so as part of the building code review, that's the building official would be reviewing for compliance with all pertinent codes, presumably including ADA. But I don't speak to the ADA code. I I'm, don't know, but that would be part of the building. That's code part of review. the building code. Yes. All right. Thank you. Yeah. And one, presumably, uh, somebody seeking out a vacation rental, if, if they were experiencing disabilities, they might be choosing options based kind of on that. It's not that every every vacation rental needs to have a ramp or those kinds of things. Right. Yeah. Interesting. Um, anything else from the commission? Uh, Chair Sherman? Oh, yes. Thanks, Vice Chair. Uh, I just had a question. Uh, did, uh, I thought there was a comment that said, was there some written testimony that came in tonight? Uh, I was I was able to read the stuff that was online, but I just want to clarify if something else came in uh, that I hadn't seen. Yeah, there were two uh, pieces of written testimony that we received, and uh, perhaps you're disappearing in like an infinity screen right now. It's pretty amazing, Josh. Um, uh, the matrix perhaps, effect. Perhaps if we, uh, I think staff is going to uh, uh, scan and probably email that to you. Right now. Um, yes. So that you yes. can have that information in front of you. Um, and we'll make sure that you have that in front of you before we move on into any deliberations. Thank you, Chair. I appreciate that. Of course. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair Freeman. I, I wasn't, I didn't even know you were with us. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to see you. <laughs> if I may, I do have a, a follow-up question, especially on the criteria reviewed, mm -hmm. uh, specifically on the uh, comprehensive plan policy 7.2.9. Uh, specifically, how is the city implementing uh, the words uh, monitor and regulate in that particular um, policy guide? Um, my concern, again, is uh, around affordable housing. I don't see how uh, number six out of 6,000, whatever that figure was, is going to necessarily affect affordable housing. but. Again, what are the kind of triggers? What are the yeah. warning signs that we're kind of uh, approaching uh, maybe an inflated housing market, specifically being um, influenced by uh, vacation rental homes? No, yeah, it's a great question. And I think, um, you know, at this, I, I'm, I'm not gonna speak for the housing plan, but I think six doesn't get us there yet. Um, as far as the affordable piece, it's a, it is a good question. We've, um, we've had the five, potentially six since 2017. So that's sort of when we uh, we approved the first one on Eaton Lane. Um, and so I think, you know, at this point, we're sort of in that, okay, we're tracking, like how many do we have? And the um, housing um, capacity analysis and, and the housing planning work that, um, that Laura is doing um, will likely be touching on sort of the short-term rental vacation rental situation as well and to see where we are. So I think um, I don't know that I have a great answer for precisely, well, when do we tip over or when are we there? Um, I'm going to say that we're not there yet. Um, and I think the point of this whole process is to be under, okay, six. I mean, if we suddenly, I don't know, got 25 next year, maybe we're going to start thinking about what we're doing. Um, but, you know, uh, Laura, I don't know if you have anything more concrete than that, but I think it's, it's, it's about having this process in place so that we can be checking and tracking and seeing where we are. But we're, we're not there yet with six, I think, so. Yeah. And, I, and I would imagine that we're also part of that tracking and enforcement kind of checks and balances right. as well, right? Like if I think we suddenly started to see 25 of these in front of us, you know, that might be the moment we decide right. to send a letter to city council saying we need to think about this right. a little bit right. more. Yeah. Yeah. Again, it's yeah. Yes. I just wanted to make sure if, if I could finish, yeah. just yeah. wanted to make sure that um, 
something was in place more than just the words on on our right. in our concert, uh, yeah. and our plan. So yeah. good. Yeah. Vice Chair Freeman. Uh, yeah, sure, uh, Sherman. I just along the same lines. I just I, I know we the there are only like five of these vacation homes. I was curious to know uh, if they were in the same um, neighborhood or NDA as the other one. Because I believe the last one we approved was also in this uh, same NDA. Mm -hmm. I'm just kind of curious to see if the the kind of how are these uh, vacation homes dispersed throughout the city? Oh, geographically, yeah. Yes. So yes. So um, so we had the one at Cherigino Farms. Um, that was the most recent one. In 2020, we approved one on Riverway Lane. So that would be in the historic Milwaukee neighborhood. In 2018, we approved two, one on Covell Street and one on Washington Street. Um, so that's Covell is Ardenwald, I think. Um, and Washington Street um, is right on the upper, out, outer edges of um, the historic Milwaukee as well. Um, and then in 2017, the first one that we did, uh, that we approved was on Eaton Lane. So that's up in the Waverly neighborhood. So historic Milwaukee. Thank you. Great. Well, if there's no other questions from the Planning Commission for staff, I'd like to invite the applicant or their representative uh, to uh, provide testimony. Is the applicant or their representative, would they like to do that? Oh, go ahead. I mean, at this point, I'm happy to address any concerns that you guys may have toward us. You, you don't uh, have but to. But I feel like we kind of addressed the major issues that okay. needed to be addressed, and okay. uh, we're happy to answer further questions if you have. Great. That sounds good. Thanks so much for being here. Appreciate that. Um, move into uh, testimony in um, testimony in support of the application. Do we have anyone who wishes to speak in support of the application? Um, again, if you're online, please raise your hand, or if you're calling in, you can press star nine now. <clears throat> there are no hands raised. Great. Online. <coughs> um, moving into uh, testimony uh, of those opposed to the application. Do we have anyone who wishes to speak in opposition of the application? Anyone in the room? Um, I believe we have um, some yellow testimony cards out front um, to, to please fill out. And again, if you're on Zoom, please raise your hand or press star nine. There are no hands raised right. online. Oh. Oh. If you could please uh, come, come up, up to the, the table. Thanks for spending your time with us this evening. And if you could give us your uh, name and city of residence. Okay. First, thank you for uh, listening to yeah. me. Uh, my name is David Drews. Uh, my address is 11665 Southeast 33rd, Milwaukee, uh, 972222. Um, the, the house in question, I, First off, I want to say I, I have no disagreement with people making money. I have no disagreement with you guys charging taxes for. Where my issue comes in is this is a residential neighborhood. Marin lives on one side of the, that property. Matt lives on the other side. We live next to Matt. Uh, Paul and Joan live on directly across from that. We're the ones that are going to lose out. I, I feel that it's going to be a detriment to our property values. Now, with that said, it's, it's, it's a neighborhood. It, we don't want a hotel in our neighborhood. That's what it is. And, and, and listening to you guys talk, this is a residential neighborhood and you're talking about commercial taxes. You're talking about commercial code. It's a hotel. And again, I'm not against people making money, but please not in our neighborhood. This is, this is where we go home at the end of our work day. This is where we want to relax, not have cars going in and out and whatnot. I, I just wanted to stay in neighborhood. And, you know, everybody walks around the, everybody that lives here, all the neighbors walk around. It's got the nice sidewalks. It's everything. Um, it's also a, a good school district and whatnot. It's uh, uh, the TriMed and all that. It's fantastic. It's a really a good place to live. I just don't feel like it needs to be spoiled with commercial. I, I got no problems if it's a long-term renter and it's their home. Again, people coming and going constantly. It, it, I don't know if I think it's kind of hard me for saying, but it kind of stinks up the neighborhood. Um, that covers most of what I've got to say. Again, I, 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 to touch on the same thing, how can you 
have a residential area and then charge commercial tax. You, you guys are kind of, I, I think this is a little bit of funny business as far as your view. It's either commercial or it's residential. Um, that's it. Thank you, sir. Thank Appreciate you. you taking the time. Anyone else um, in the audience uh, wish to speak kind of in opposition to the application? Great. If you could um, join us at the table, uh, maybe fill out a car or you, you could fill it out after the fact. Um, and again, if you could, you're, uh, and you can have a seat or, or stand, whatever, if, yeah. whatever you choose there. Um, and again, uh, just name, we don't need your address, but city for the record, I'm going to start my time. Uh, yeah, Matthew Bullard, uh, Milwaukee, Oregon. And I don't have a lot to say. I don't have any any cause to object to the application based on the site use or the criteria. But I just want to do one record and say that I agree with uh, Dave and his testimony, and I basically second his uh, his opinion. So just to be on record that we really don't want this kind of use in our neighborhood. Um, and like I said, I don't have a lot more to say, but I want to do one record saying I I uh, agree with him. Great. Thanks. I appreciate you showing up, uh, Matthew. Chair, I, I have a question for this speaker, if I could. Please. Sure. I think is please keep it con confined to the testimony that he just gave. Thanks. Uh, I will confine it to the written testimony that was put in, knowing you are the next door neighbor of the property right next door. Yes, correct. Uh, and so um, could you uh, help explain to the commission what, what uh, kind of landscaping or what kind of barrier is between your two yards? Um, there is uh, just a short chain link fence currently. And uh, discussion with the property representative last week, they did say that they intended to put a uh, privacy barrier up. And uh, I don't know if that's a condition of the, the use. I, I think it should be, but uh, um, yeah, I'd appreciate if, the, if they did put that in. And when, and when you, could you describe a privacy bear? Are you talking something that's six foot tall or something? Yeah, about six foot tall, just so that I don't, you know, our dog doesn't get distracted too much by things going on in their yard and they're not just kind of watching what's going on in my yard, you know, sort of things. Okay. That's all I had. Thank you. Thanks. Um... Any other testimony in opposition? Hearing none, uh, we'll move forward into neutral testimony. Does anyone off wish to offer neutral testimony? Again, if you're online, you can raise your hand. If you're calling in, you can press star nine. Uh, Chair Sherman? Yes, Vice Chair. Uh, I just wanna... Uh to let you know that I received the two letters of uh, opposition uh, and I have reviewed them uh, in their entirety. Great. I uh, just want to make, make it known that I was reviewed as far as opposition. Thank you, uh, Vice Chair Freeman. All right. Um, are there uh, any staff response to any of the testimony that received? No? Yeah. Um, Questions from the commission. We already uh, heard one question. Does any other member of the planning commission have uh, questions regarding testimony? Does uh, the applicant um, have any rebuttal to or any additional comments in response to any of the uh, public testimony that we heard tonight or that was submitted, kind of written into the record? Not at this moment. Okay. Great. Um, so I will close the public testimony hearing of this uh, uh, testimony portion of the hearing. Uh, the public testimony portion of the hearing on the request for a conditional use for vacation rental in the RMD zone, file CU-2002-006, is now closed. Um, I'd like to open it up. Uh, for discussion from the commission. Is the commission ready for discussion? Sure. Uh, I'll start. Um, so I, I think that uh, if we approve this tonight, I think that we do need to put in uh, uh, the condition of the six foot high uh, fence surrounding the property on the three sides. So the side yard, the uh, backyard, and then the other side yard. Um, 
it's an unfortunate uh, thing, but uh, good fences make good neighbors. And, uh, and I think that will help uh, 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 keep some of the noise and at least a, a barrier to keep the guests uh, understanding where that property line is and will help resolve some uh, conflict that may uh, happen without that six foot high fence. Be curious to, to hear from anyone else on 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 that. I do, um, you know. I think if the applicant is already planning on doing this, I don't know if we need to condition it. Um, uh, I would like to make it a condition of approval, uh, just so that we make sure that it uh, uh, that it had not, not that we don't trust the applicant uh, and their plans. It's just uh, okay. like to get it. If we put it officially onto the record, then we know that it uh, will be done. Uh, Commissioner Hammer, I support that, and I think it further um, helps us uh, kind of separate the uses um, so that uh, what may be seen as a commercial use is separated um, by residential use or vice versa. And um, that's most likely in the, in the development code um, as it stands for uh, land uses that um, are commercial use, if they're abutting residential use, I'm sure that there's some sort of um, screening that is required. And so, um, again, I, I, I support the, the extra, extra separation. Uh, Vice Chair Freeman, any, any thoughts uh, from you? Uh, yes, sure. I, I actually would oppose the additional um, requirement for the fence. I, I don't think it's required by the by the standard. I would I would uh, say that we should, if we vote in favor as staff has submitted. Uh, I don't think because this is a vacation use that there's a requirement to put up a fence. Uh, this is a residential zone, and we wanted a fence. The residents would just put up a fence normally. I don't think that that extra onus should be put on the, the applicant. Commissioner Hurt? Um, code doesn't require a fence to be put up currently. No, it doesn't. And I think, um, I think our fellow commissioners pointed out that there's probably other provisions in code where it does, but again, this code does not. And What would the reasoning be for the condition? It's my logic is is that um, uh, because you have a constant stage of visitors that they don't they're not quite aware of their surroundings. So by giving them a privacy fence, not only does it give direction towards the visitors to know that hey, this is the boundary. It also creates uh, a better neighbor so that uh, if there's something going on uh, in the backyard, they don't have to view it uh, as well. Um, uh, they, it helps cut down on the noise uh, uh, in the neighborhood. And it also gives them uh, a peace of mind knowing that uh, strangers, let's be honest, uh, guests um, aren't there to to look into their houses or to uh, make them uh, feel uncomfortable or unsafe. I would support, I'd support that condition. Maybe. Yeah, I would also just retort to, to Commissioner Humer's comment. Like, I understand like you don't want other people looking into the, the neighbors, but if there was a, a, a normal rental in that place, if there were normal renters in that, in that in the house, then you know they would still be able to look over into their neighbor's yard. I just I don't see the correlation between. Uh, so uh, I'm I'm happy to explain the correlation. Uh, if it's a long term renter, they they are a neighbor. Um, they are somebody that they're going to see every day, um, week over week, week over week. We're talking people that they're going to see for two or three days and then they're gone. So if there is a uh, a short-term, to, to avoid a short-term conflict, 
uh, I think it would just be better to provide the uh, privacy fence um, just to avoid uh, any privacy issues on, on both sides. Yeah, I, I, I still would disagree. I, I, you know, I have neighbors that live on my street that I don't see all the time. Uh, and like, I, I still don't see it's, it's the onus of the applicant to do that. If, you know, if I, if my neighbor next door wanted to have some privacy for me, we'd probably maybe go half on the fence, but I, you know, it sounds like the applicant wants to do it anyway, but I, <clears throat> I still don't think it should be a condition of approval. And maybe we can, maybe we can kind of pull up out of the weeds. Like we jumped in really fast into a fence. Um, can we talk kind of maybe more broadly about the application and uh, kind of whether and how we feel it, it meets the conditions of approval? May I ask staff to bring up the conditions of approval again onto the, the screen so that we have those? Or just the highlighted ones that we're worried about. The conditions of approval or the approval criteria? I think, sorry, the approval criteria. Um, Sorry, yeah. No, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think I, um, I think as staff articulated, I think that we have satisfied kind of the burden of proof on most of the approval criteria. Um, I understand, you know, some potential hypothetical issues, but again, those aren't, those aren't um, issues, and I, I would say that I um, personally understand some of the concerns that that members of the community have, have raised. Um, but and a number of those concerns are also not based necessarily on these approval criteria, and therefore aren't something we can really take action on. Um, I think for for members of the of the community of which we are your neighbors, um, you know, I think dissatisfaction about this vacation rental or other vacation rentals, I would say, is you know really a topic of a conversation to have with city council. And I know we we know some of our fellow city councilors who used to serve on planning commission with us. And I think they'd be more than happy to meet with you and and hear about some of these issues and then think about some of those changes because. Again, I think most of the testimony we've received is on the broader policy around should we have short-term rentals in the city or not. Um, and that's not the choice we're, we have to make tonight. Like we have our choices around, you know, does this application meet, meet these requirements? Um, so I think that's just one thing that I wanted to make sure to share with, with members of the community. And you can find your city councilors' emails very easily at milwaukeeoregon.gov forward slash city council. Um, and um, so, yeah, I, I think in many regards, um, you know, as was recommended by staff, I think this meets most of the criteria. But again, would love to hear from other members of the just commission as well. Perhaps a clarifying question. Um, the I'm looking at criteria four for unmitigated nuisance impacts. Um, there are outdoor uh, decibel readers as well as indoor decibel I readers. Believe there, um, I believe it was indoor decibel readers that was um, submitted as part of the applicant. Maybe I can ask the appli applicant that to confirm. I would have to refer to them, and unfortunately, they were not able to attend tonight. Okay. I do know they have. They have what they call party squasher but it's, it's it's some kind of software that actually monitors the number can, of can you come up to them that's my understanding also monitors the number oh. of Go. <laughs> <laughs> there's also it's my understanding it's it's, it's called party squashers it's some sort of app i actually can pull it up if you need me to that actually monitors also the number of um and i'm not sure how they do it but they do the number of occupants in the home based upon the number of cell phones, you know, that are coming through the home or, or laptops being used and things like that. So they, they do monitor that to make sure that there's not 21 people in the house instead of the, the eight that's there. Um, and they do check noise levels. And, and it's my understanding from iTrip that they will actually reach out to the person staying in the home if the noise levels are above a certain level. Now, exactly what that that noise level is, I would have to, you know, defer for them that information. But um, 
they they will they do monitor and they can evict if the person staying there does not comply they can even ask them to leave thank you and that information goes directly to the project the property manager that good the, or, yes it's monitored by by i trip our management company correct so if the noise is uh considered a nuisance by that monitor it is sent directly to the property manager or does it go to code enforcement no, so, so it property goes manager. directly to the property management okay. and yeah. they in turn reach out to the person there let them know hey right. you're you're with you know you're here and obviously they will respond accordingly as needed if things are not adjusted to change i believe they can be fined and they can be evicted and then, asked to leave their premises. and then presumably if it was also loud enough that it's triggering in the app and the technology neighbors are maybe hearing it and placing phone calls to the local authority as well correct yeah thank you oh can i chime in yeah sorry did you have no okay. um so I've said this before, and my job is really to just look at the approval criteria and, you know, based off of the code and policies that we have in place. Um, I just want to share because we're talking about noise decibels and partying and that stuff. And this is my personal experience, which doesn't affect how we rule because, again, it's based off of the code. Um, but I have an aunt, and she has an adult. 23 year old um, son who has a lot of disabilities, it's nearly impossible for us to stay at a hotel because she's got three children. So we use Airbnb or, or um, these type of rentals because it really fits our family the best because there's more options for everybody to kind of still be together, but also have potentially multiple bathrooms because there's a lot of challenges with having a 23 year old who, um, has the challenges that he has. And so I just wanted to kind of add that personal um, anecdotal story in there as far as there's people like my family who really do use these type of rentals because we can't use hotels. It just doesn't work for our situation. And we're not loud partiers by any means. We're playing bingo and in bed by nine o'clock. Um, so that's... That's all I wanted to share, but Great. based off of the pri uh, approval criteria, I think it does meet it and I'm ready to. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Commissioner, for sharing that uh, personal story as well. Um, Vice Chair Freeman, um, do you have any uh, perspective on um, how you kind of stand on this proposed application? Yeah, I would I would generally agree that, yeah, the applicant has met the, the criteria. Um, I've reviewed some of the other comments from the residents, but I, I don't think they speak specifically to the, the client that we have to uh, make a determination on, so. Great. Commissioner Carpenter. I don't have any further questions or comments. Commissioner Hemer. Yeah, I'd like to see a straw uh, poll on the commission about the fence. fence. Before you share your broader perspectives on the application. No, I, I mean, I, I understand for all of you out there, the fear and the worry. I would not want to have to live next to a party house. What the applicant has, has created is some fail safes to make sure that there aren't 50, 90 year old kids showing up and all of a sudden there's a gunfight. I mean, let's be honest. I mean, that's what the fear is. Um, I also understand uh, one that's very close with my neighbors and who enjoy their, we all enjoy our company very much, the value of having a neighbor. You trade tools. You take care of each other, you mow each other's lawn, you trade out your uh, 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 garbage bin, you know, when somebody needs a little bit more extra space. I mean, that's what neighbors do, right? And I understand the hesitancy of trying to live with a place that uh, you don't have that consistency. 
uh, unfortunately, the rules are the way that the rules are. And when you look at it and you say, well, look, if you were adding a six into an inventory of 6,000, you're not really affecting the house. Um, even the comment uh, that we had in, uh, in the written testimony about that this is still actually advertised as a long-term rental, uh, which may actually say that, you know, it, it, it could flip at yeah. any point in time, right? Um, that that might still be part of the game plan. Um, I agree with the, with the public testimony that, it, that I think that privacy on both ends because of the nature of the business and not being able to know your neighbor or not wanting that there is no need to know your neighbor, that a six foot high privacy fence is beneficial to both parties. I think it just, I, I think it mitigates a nuisance for our, when we look at our uh, approval criteria. So, um, and an expected uh, nuisance. So um, yeah, that's why I'd like the straw poll. If that is not in there, I will not be voting for this tonight. Right. Well, um, thanks everyone for, for sharing your perspectives. And I also understand kind of the, some of the concerns that, that you mentioned and as well as the concerns that kind of, I think mm -hmm. some members of the community have, um, you know, it sounds like in, in many ways, you know, it sounds like it's been challenging over the last six years, having this, you know, what in some ways probably reasonably classified as a nuisance property um, as your as your neighbor. And I think I hear where that is kind of driving fear about this change that's happening. Um, and and, you know, while I personally haven't lived through that, um, I can kind of end, I can understand where where you're coming from. I will also say Personally, as a fellow Milwaukee neighbor, I live two houses down from, I think, one of our five vacation rentals in the city. And we haven't had any issues. Um, again, that's just kind of one experience. Um, but it uh, generally has, has been totally fine. I wave at the people when they show up and they wave sometimes back and we all kind of go on our ways. I can't borrow a cup of sugar from them, um, <laughs> but I've got a lot of other great neighbors that I can do that from. Um, I think in many ways this has met kind of the, bur the burden of proof and the applicable criteria. I'm ready to move forward with it. And, and I might be willing to entertain the, the fence as a condition of approval only because the applicant has already said they're going to do it. I think we might want to think about this as a code cleanup at, at some point. Like I'm thinking about other places that we require fences or privacy screening, accessory units in backyards, near lot lines, uh, flag lots. Uh, you know, is, is this materially different than that? I don't know, but our code doesn't kind of state that right now. And so maybe that is something we want to think, think more about in the future. Um, but because the applicants already kind of essentially said they're going to do it, I, I don't know if it's a major issue here. Um, so that's kind of where I stand on that straw poll. Sounds uh, <clears throat> maybe where's our others on the added condition of approval on um, six foot privacy, privacy fence. Um, Chair Sherman, it sounds like I'm the main one with all the opposition to the addition. I, I would not be in favor of adding it in. Um, you know, I, I see it as, you know, not keeping separate. I, I say with the, with the absence of a fence, there's opportunity to make a bunch of new friends. And every time there's a, a new um, family coming in, that's, that's an opportunity for making new friends. It's not part of the code. I don't think we should require it. I won't vote in favor of adding it in. Okay. Um, I would also agree with that statement. Uh, it's not required in the code, but I would support um, or suggest next time there's a, a code update that we we take a look at those requirements for for screening as well. Um, and I will say um, I've lived across the street from a um, short-term rental before. And uh, I will. Uh, one major benefit is that um, the landscaping is definitely kept up. So um, <laughs> there's no complaints there. Um, 
yeah, so I, I, I don't know if I would um, uh, vote to deny based on, on the, the fence issue. Well, um, and I could go the other way on the fence, frankly. Frank, fence is going to get built. I don't know if we need to require a fence. So, um, Commissioner Ert. Same. Great. Uh, Vice Chair Freeman, uh, do you have a motion for me? Uh, Chair, I would make a motion that we uh, approve the application as submitted by staff. Great. So uh, we have a motion to approve application CU-2002-006 as recommended by staff. All in favor, say aye. Second. Oh, I need that seconded. Thank you. Second. The, the motion's been seconded. Any, uh, any discussions on the motion? Hearing none, call a vote. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 Four, in, four ayes. All those opposed, say nay. Nay, because I don't think that we mitigated the new assistances. Uh, the motion passes. Um, we have approved application CU-2002-006. Um, importantly for community members as well as anybody that submitted written testimony, um, if anyone wishes to appeal the Planning Commission's decision to the Milwaukee City Council, you must make applications stating the grounds of your appeal within 15 days of the mailing of the notice of decision. Um, if this is something you would like to learn some more about, uh, you can connect with uh, Vera or Laura uh, for more details. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, like, don't have maybe one. propose quick five minute bio break. Five. Yeah. Okay. Great. <laughs>
right, we are back on air. Um, item 6.2, Downtown Design Review Code Amendments. This is a continuation from October 25th. Um, the continued public hearing on the Downtown Design Review Code Amendments is called to order. It's kind of fun, the gavel. Until you're enjoying um, <laughs> the purpose of this, <laughs> The purpose of this hearing is to continue the commission. You don't get the gavel in the Zoom world. There's no, yeah, there's like a cheer icon, a clap your hands, a thumbs up. You don't get the gavel. Uh, the purpose of this hearing is to continue the commission's consideration of application number ZA-2022-003 for the downtown mixed use zone. The applicant, has, which is this city. city. Is this, I don't know if this is relevant. Um, I, I read it. The applicant has the burden of proving the application is consistent with the city zoning per, uh, zoning uh, ordinances, comprehensive plan, any applicable municipal code provisions, and that the pro proposal conforms with the city's applicable criteria, I would like to ask uh, Mr. Kelver to cite the zoning ordinances where the criteria can be found. All right, thank you. Yeah, the applicable sections of the zoning code are 19.902, amendments to maps and ordinances, and 19.1008, type 5 review. Great. All testimony and evidence must be directed towards the applicable substantive criteria, fail to address a criterion or raise an issue with sufficient detail, allows planning commission an adequate opportunity to respond to each issue, precludes appeal to the city council based on that issue, failure to raise constitutional or other issues related to proposed conditions of approval with sufficient detail to allow a response, precludes an action for damages in circuit court. Any party withstanding may appeal the decision of the Planning Commission to the Milwaukee City Council. Persons withstanding are those who submit comments or testify. We will recognize those persons submitting testimony of which we have no members in the audience. Um, if there are members in uh, the Zoom, please state your name and city of residence for the record so that they could be entered into the minutes. Um, and if you're here, please remember to confine your remarks to the application and the relevant criteria and avoid repetition and information that's not relevant. I'd just like to point out, I think that is, yeah. is I think this, is, I think this is not the policy yeah, script. There's yeah. no ability to appeal the decision of the Planning Commission in a type five proceeding so great thank thanks justin yeah. i appreciate that um and do we have the abstaining language conflicts of interest language uh, ex parte um, contacts i think all that no. is not okay um let's proceed to the staff report <laughs> okay good evening Chair, Commissioners, welcome. First introduction to Commissioner Carpenter. Commissioner Freeman, good to have you with us virtually. I'm Brett Kelver, a senior planner with the city of Milwaukee, and I'll pick things up where we left off in October. Let me just do a quick screen share here. All right, so picking up from October 25th, um, I just wanted to do a really quick review um, for the benefit of uh, the viewing public. Um, the, the project, this project is focused on uh, two particular sections of the code and acknowledgement of a separate document, a downtown design guidelines document. Um, it's something that the, our, the downtown, sorry, the Design and Landmarks Committee, the city's committee that's focused on downtown design and historic preservation has been working on for the last five to six years. And the, the project has included an assessment of gaps between existing design guidelines and design standards um, and has been, been making an effort to just make everything more clear, more connected, not so much to create new standards as to clarify what we have um, and to make sure that everything is, is gonna function both for applicants who are wanting to develop in the city, for neighborhoods reviewing projects, for staff, for decision makers. So what we have done is we've focused on three sections of the code that relate to downtown design, 19.304, the downtown 
or downtown mixed use zone standards where our development standards are 19.508, which is where the downtown design standards are, 19.907, which is the section that kind of oversees the whole design review process. And the effort has included uh, an attempt to kind of establish two very clear tracks for review so that there's a one track is uh, involves clear and objective standards. So again, for developers, they, they know what the standards are. If they can show they meet the standards, uh, the project moves forward. For projects that warrant a little more, uh, they're wanting some more creativity or want to do something a little bit different, but believe their project still meets the spirit of the intent of, of our, our uh, design standards, that's what the design guidelines are for. And so overall, the intent has been to make sure that even when a project is just meeting um, the standards that we're fairly well guaranteed that we're going to get a good looking building. Um, that's, that's been the effort all along with the, with the design and landmarks committee. Uh, we have a lot of architectural expertise on that committee. And so this effort to kind of make sure that the, the standards are up to date and that kind of pull in kind of the best current architectural practices that's that's been a uh, something that's been kind of informing the entire the entire process so october 25th we came to you um, after a work session or two and uh, with the the first hearing for this um, a reminder of the planning commission's role in this kind of legislative process process is you have the first crack at looking at at the code in in this official approval process and your role is to provide a recommendation to the city council so we're making up new new rules and the new rules get adopted by city council but your recommendation um, is very important for that in general uh, the takeaway from the discussion um, on staff's part was that there was overall support for the, the package, but there was a, a, a real interest among the commissioners to, to explore opportunities to, uh, to not miss, miss this chance if, if it was possible to establish some kind of a, a public art component, uh, another design element that would include standards as well as guidelines. And so that's what, that's what we've spent um, our time on in the interim since October 25th. And, and a lot of that, um, our efforts are reflected in the staff report, so I won't I won't go into to great detail about that. But I, I guess I would just I wanted to highlight a couple of the what we identified as key some of the key questions that were brought up from that discussion, um, and give a real quick overview of of our summary. You know, one really fair question was since all the local jurisdictions in Oregon are playing with kind of the same overarching state rules, is anybody else in Oregon? Um, requiring public art with some clear and objective standards and and our our response was that no we 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 noted several of the communities that we looked at and and that's that's something for that for a lot of the reasons that are discussed elsewhere in the staff report it's just not not happening um and i think the commission understands the the structure that we're working with and with that in mind you all raised a lot of really creative attempts to like okay how can we how can we get at this um i think i think you're recognizing that that art by its nature uh involves some discretion um some people like this thing some people don't like that thing you know what's good art i know it when i see it kind of thing and i think with that in mind you threw out some really interesting creative ideas can we um kick an application over into a discretionary review and say they check the clear and objective box if they agree to you know to follow a more discretionary process and that you know for reasons we explain in the report isn't isn't really workable in in this kind of process can we have some kind of a fee in lieu of so don't hold my project up I'll I'll pay some money in lieu of building the public art and and that also doesn't really work for for some similar reasons the construction excise tax or CET program that percent for our programs also don't quite get at what what you're trying to to get at in this context of when we're getting new buildings being proposed and they're going through this process so i think a, a key thing that we noted and wanted to emphasize in the staff report was that there there's just a lot of risk and issue with creating taking situations where whether the art ends up being owned somehow by the public or owned by the private developer that there are significant issues with and concerns about takings there and i guess just just a, a, a reminder in that to, to touch back on something i think you all are aware of is that like i mentioned before part of what's involved with art decisions is discretion is you know I, I think we we would want to be careful about 
you know, an effort to try to standardize and provide some clear and objective requirements for art naturally turns loose a tether on an ability to have some discretion and to and to agree that this particular art or that particular art is appropriate for the community and that that i think just kind of underlies the entire um the entire effort there so with th with that in mind I, I think i just want to uh turn it back over to you all more or less uh you know we we have the the criteria for approval of this kind of amendment in general to the to the zoning text you know our, our checking consistency with all these different things comp plan goals other sections of the zoning ordinance state state goals um, I think in the staff report, we clarified the, the two options that we we're proposing in order to kind of keep this process moving forward and help you fulfill your role as providing a recommendation. Um, you know, based on, on the work we've done, we are recommending um, that you do approve the, the amendments as proposed. Um, or if, if, you, if there really continues to be heartburn about, about the public art issue, then our, our recommendation would be that you offer the city council your recommendation of a denial and let the council pick it up from there. So with that in mind, just the next two dates that we have upcoming, we have uh, time on the council calendar on February 14th for a study session, work session on this. We'll present similar information that you all received late last year. And then uh, depending on how that conversation goes, we, we are holding some time on their March 21st agenda for adoption of the new rules so with that in mind i guess i will ask if you have any any questions before you resume yeah your thanks uh maybe before opening it up for questions from the another infinity screen um other questions from the commission um just want to say thanks for all the work on this i think um be i i it'll be my words i'll say I think we sent you on a little bit of a goose chase um, and appreciate all the geese you tried to catch um, and the things that you learned along the way. I mean, it's clear that you, you spent a lot of time looking at this, looking at kind of the broader legal context, looking at what other cities have done or not done. Um, and so really appreciate that, especially Brett and Laura, you know, you know, the planning team is small and, um, you know, this was some extra work. So I just wanted to kind of open, open with that. And then I had kind of an initial question before maybe opening it up for other members of the commission. Um, I know, in, uh, uh, some of us on the commission uh, work in the, the planning field and uh, might understand takings, but was wondering if either staff or the city attorney could give a, you know, a, a quick, you know, one, one or two minute primer on, on the takings topic as it relates to the public art discussion, because I think it's important. One or two minutes, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Um, well, t takings is a, a line of law or legal decision that's largely based out of and grows out of both state and federal constitutions. And it is a limitation on what the government is allowed to do with private property. Um, in the, I, I, I think the, I'll paraphrase the words in the Constitution. I believe that it's unconstitutional for a government to uh, take private property for a public use without the payment of just compensation. In um, the most, I guess, clear example is when the, the government actually takes your property, right? Um, but that has, that, that may have happened long ago, uh, but now through years of jurisprudence and interpretations of the constitutional provisions and more detailed government actions, uh, the pencil's been sharpened quite a bit. And we look at a variety of different types of takings. There's a regulatory taking. So when a, a government regulation uh, that the government passes a set of rules or laws that takes all the value of your property, there's case law now that says that that's a taking, right? Um, there's also case law that says when the government passes an ordinance or law or rule that requires uh, something to occupy your property, that's also a taking. Um, the, one of the key cases that went up to the United States Supreme Court, and I may get some of the facts wrong, but I think you'll get the idea. Uh, the city of New York passed an ordinance that required apartment buildings to allow the cable companies or telephone companies at the time to put a little box on the exterior of the building. 
And that went all the way up to the Supreme Court of the United States. And by virtue of the government requiring the apartment owner to allow this little box to be placed on their property, that was a physical occupation. So not a regulatory taking, but a physical taking. They were actually taking a space, part of the space of the property, and that was a violation of the Constitution. So those boxes had to come off, or they had to pay a fee, right? Uh, all this grandiose takings litigation that reaches the United States Supreme Court, and uh, a lot of it is, is big and blustery when it's in front of the court, and then it ends with a whimper. Like they end up settling the case after the decision or something crazy happens. But the key fight is about the government's appropriation of private property. In the public art context, one of the problems we bump into is that by using a clear and objective criteria to achieve a public purpose here, public art, you would actually be causing a private property owner to give up some right that he has for a public purpose. Now that might seem like an insignificant right when we sit and talk about it, but a lot of these insignificant rights that are on these grandiose United States Supreme Court cases may seem insignificant when we talk about it, but it's actually a violation of the Constitution to allow that taking to happen without the payment of just compensation. Um, you know, we see, we see takings in other areas when we condemn property, right? If the government needs a pathway to get to something. You can't just take the pathway. People have their property rights and are able to exclude. That's one of the most valuable uh, property rights. We, we talk about property rights as a bundle of sticks. One of the most valuable sticks in the, in the bundle of sticks is the right to exclude somebody from your property. Now, public art, I wouldn't say, rises to that occasion where we're occupying their property to such an extent that it's valueless, but we're actually asking them to donate or give something to the government for a public purpose without paying just compensation. Great. I don't know if that's, I went over probably a minute or two. A minute or two, but I, you still okay? got a few gold stars. So okay. good, good job there. Um, great. Well, I, maybe uh, open it up to members of the commission for questions for staff. And if I may, I'm sorry, I was remiss to not say that we also tonight virtually present, we have um, Chair Cynthia Schuster, Chair of the DLC, is in the Great. in the Zoom universe with us. If if there are questions or if there's anything that she can speak to, and also Elizabeth Decker, who's the the code consultant that we worked with Great. on the project, is available as well. So I'll keep an eye to see if they raise any hands at some point or if there's some question that we think yeah. they might help you address. There. And, and you said uh, who's the the chair of the DLC? Cynthia Schuster. Cynthia, I would just like to uh, invite Cynthia to uh, join in, maybe at any moment. Uh, up until deliberation, um, just to welcome her as an equal member of, of of our discussion. I'll promote them both Great. into yeah, panel thanks. situation. Okay. So, Chair, if I, I think the DLC worked on it for over three. It years. sounds like it was. Yeah, I mean, I remember I from the October twenty fifth, it was a long process, and then we delayed it a, another two months. Um, so, um, uh, yes, Commissioner, I, I have I have a clarifying question overall. Is it required by Oregon state law or anywhere that we have a clear and objective path or a type one situation in our building code for a particular zone? I, if I, well, if I understand what I think the, the question is you're getting at, I th my understanding is that, that the state law requiring clear and objective path relates to housing primarily. So where housing is being proposed, I think there's a, there is a requirement to provide an option to meet clear and objective standards or go through a discretionary process. I'm not sure that that's required for other types of projects that don't have a housing component. Um, now, when you say housing component, does that mean a quarter of it is housing, um, one room of it is housing? A mixed-use project, for example, that has maybe commercial um, storefronts on the ground level and housing units above, I think that would that would fall into the category of needing to have a clear and objective uh, path. I, I would also say that local jurisdictions strive to have a clear and objective pathway. Uh, to provide developers a clean and easy way to develop property without having to go through uh, an approval process. Um, we vet 
and look at standards and come up with ideas through the DLC's review, through your review, all the way up to the city council to arrive at a package of guidelines that can allow a developer who has the development ready site if they so choose to come in and use those guidelines to maybe develop a piece of property in a quicker fashion than having to have, have guidelines that are subject to all sorts of discretion all over the place. It's a very inefficient system. Uh, and so I think by and large, all, all jurisdictions that I've ever worked with have typically had a, some sort of guidelines to provide developers that pathway. Quite often, they're not able because of a developer's idea about what they want to do with their property. They have to seek variances or as we've learned over and over in applications, we're not always talking about a perfect rectilinear piece of property that's got the perfect <laughs> setbacks for what you want to do. And so developers tend to have to dip their toe in one pool and also dip their toe in the other. And the way we deal with that is everything gets moved into the the uh, quasi-judicial discretionary path when we when we have to go that route. Can I can I say um, I have a hand raised from Elizabeth Decker, so I'll ask her if she wants to weigh in on this. I have a response. Here we go. Yeah. Good evening, uh, members of the Planning Commission and Chair. Thank you for having me, uh, Elizabeth Decker with Jet Planning, twenty seven twelve Southeast Twentieth Avenue in Portland, Oregon. Um, and just to weigh in to clarify this distinction that um, we had two purposes that were identified for why we wanted to create a clear and objective path uh, for downtown development. And the first, absolutely related to the housing piece and mixed use development. Um, you know, I'm not your city attorney. You're you're ably um, advised by your attorney tonight, uh, as mentioned just now, that um, having a clear and objective path for residential is what's required under state law. Um, so under the current Milwaukee Code, there is an option um, to, for residential development in downtown to either comply with the downtown standards or in order to ensure that there is a true clear and objective option, the uh, multifamily development in downtown can currently um, comply just with the multifamily design standards that apply citywide. Um, and that was sort of the, the escape valve to make sure that the legal requirements for clear and objective were met. However, the discussion that we had at DLC is that that relief valve didn't really ensure that residential development downtown was meeting the overall downtown design standards. And so there was interest to make the standards clear and objective so that all development, residential or non-residential, was being held to the same set of standards and that um, future development would bring in those pieces of downtown design um, that are more appropriate for a downtown setting than you know, a more suburban apartment complex in um, a different type of residential neighborhood setting. So that was our first motivation that we discussed. And then also the discussion was, you know, if clear and objective is a good practice, or it, well, beyond a good practice, if it's a legal requirement for residential development, that um, providing that clarity and certainty of one path for certain projects that can qualify um, for non-residential development also is an important sort of economic development tool um, and communication tool for non-residential development to have that opportunity. Um, you know, certainly we recognized in many of our discussions about the clear and objective standards that they were not a one size fits all. Um, they weren't gonna be able to cover every scenario. Probably a really good example of that um, is thinking about the new library design. We spent a lot of time talking about um, the tripartite design standards for facades, which set sort of a, a base, middle, and top um, for different, for, you know, sort of a, a classical downtown building look. And we spent a lot of time talking about, well, should we have some sort of clear and objective standard that is not tripartite design? And the consensus this was, no, that's the clear and objective path. And if you want to do something different, you know, if you've got the library or if you've got some other type of project with a really um, innovative facade design that's providing, you know, contributing to the downtown design in a different way, that then that was the appropriate path for the discretionary um, guidelines to come in. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thanks, Elizabeth. And I think that some of that is also a helpful recap for, I think, some of the discussion that the commission had on the 25th of October and was generally aligned around. Any other questions for staff? 
Can I ask a question to Cynthia? Sure. Sure. I'm here. I keep the camera. Yeah, yeah. Every time I look at that, the camera takes me back over. Hi, Cynthia. Hey, um, so, um, uh, this this discussion around public art was actually uh, based off of the hard work that the DLC did um, to make Axel Tree such a unique building downtown. And so part of the concern was, well, if we have straight and objective design standards without the influence of DLC and their great and hard work, um, we're just going to get a bunch of plain Jane, typical architectural buildings uh, without any sort of thing. And that's how this public art thing kind of got thrown into the mix. So, mm -hmm. uh, Cynthia, can you tell us about, um, uh, you know, how you worked with Axel Tree uh, to include some of this art? And then, um, uh, and then was that discussed during your DLC conversations? It was. It was actually, I think, one of our recommendations um, to the Planning Commission was we had some blank walls that we felt were visible from the public right of ways from Main Street. Um, and so we had asked them to fill some of that in with some sort of public art, um, not knowing what they would come up with, of course. And that's a whole other discussion was, you know, what's the process for the city to to handle that requirement once it's, once it's given um, as a recommendation and accepted by the Planning Commission. So, um, you know, then what happens once they go through, you know, permitting, is that when it's looked at? I don't know, that's just a question on my mind, but that's how that came about is, you know, it's very hard for any building to meet, I think even the objective standards 100%, I think would be really tough. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think you're always going to get some unique situations and they aren't going to be able to meet the transparency requirements or the glazing requirements or, you know, there's always going to be something I think that'll crop up um, so that we would all get an eye on it. Thanks, Cynthia. Yeah. Any other questions uh, from the commission? Vice Chair Freeman, anything uh, in Zoom land from you? Uh, no, no questions at this time, Chair. Okay. Well, are we ready to, uh, I think, maybe move into discussion? Seeing a lot of blank faces. I I'm ready to move into discussion. Thank sure. you. Thank you. Um, great. Well, uh, Commissioner I'll Hamer, yeah, I'll let you leave. Start this sure. off. Yeah, please. Bear with me because this is... This is the story. So I hate going to Costco, but my wife makes me her Costco buddy. So I have tried everything. I have uh, been really slow pushing around the cart. I have thrown in two to $300 worth of stuff that we don't need. I go around to every sample table. I just start conversations with strangers, anything to never ever for her to say, you are so annoying. I don't want you to go to Costco. And uh, because we're married and because we love each other, I sacrifice the burden of going to Costco to make my wife uh, feel good. I look at it in this uh, uh, same fashion as this. Although that I believe that we have the best staff, probably not only in the state, but probably in the country, and we have a certainly capable city attorney, maybe one of the best in the state, <laughs> that you guys have worked really, really hard on, on this and looked at all avenues. And just, and just like me, I, um, uh, I, I looked really hard for it for three weeks too, to try to come up with it. I think that there's maybe some suggestions that uh, we might be able to offer city council on this. Uh, I, I, I hate the word public art because it's not really what, yeah. it's about incorporating art into a, a building that is privately held so that the public can see it. Um, but just like uh, I may grumble and moan when we have to go to Costco and I may stamp my feet and pout and sigh a lot, 
I still always go. So I'm going to give up my fight on the public art. I may pout and I may moan. Uh, and I may ask for a recommendation for city council to look at it further. Um, but uh, because we live in this great city and because I see uh, the planning commission along with our planning staff as partners, I won't torture you anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for all the hard work. Yeah. I second that. I second that as well. Yeah. Third that. <laughs> any other any uh, any other discussion from other other commissioners? Just saying thank you for all the hard work. Yeah. To um, everybody. Yeah, Chair, I would I would also uh, just, you know, say thanks for all the hard work for all the different committees. Uh, and the, the planning staff, especially for the last couple months, trying to really hammer out, find a solution to getting in more public art. Um, I'm on the Milwaukee uh, Arts Committee, and, you know, I'm, I'm definitely a big proponent of art. And, you know, hopefully we can at some point figure out a solution to definitely increase the amount of art around the city. Yeah, and I think that's a, a sentiment that I share as well. And, and uh, Commissioner Hemer, I, I like your idea about um, maybe the commission uh, sending a letter off to city council, encouraging them as this makes it to them on uh, Valentine's Day to uh, think about how much they love art as well. Um, and so, you know, maybe if there's no other additional discussion, um, maybe we could get a motion that also includes that recommendation for the count for the planning commission to draft a letter to the uh, city council. Yeah, and so uh, on this art issue, um, so I was racking my brain, uh, not while I was shopping at Costco, but uh, I was. Uh, I thought, well, okay, so how can we ensure? right, art that is incorporated into uh, a building. So, um, you know, maybe we do it by calling, uh, you know, an artistic value to screening or an artistic value to um, a cornice or, or something along, right? We strengthen what those design standards are that create more of a, uh, an artistic feel or to at least kind of drive the juices a little bit, right, to think about it. Um, uh, I mean, even if you just say that the screening is uh, designed by a, a, a public artist um, or a professional artist, um, uh, something along those lines, right, Where or we uh, uh, allow for coloring in pavement, you know, to... Uh, you know, give a, a street mural uh, design or or something along those kind of lines, yeah. just kind of add it, you know, strengthening those downtown standards to include those kind of things. Do you understand what I mean by that? Well, and I, and I think, yeah, I mean, some of the, I think the working through this process, you know, we've sent you all some things. Uh, I think it's helped me, I think, as well, hone in and on, you know, how do we incorporate more of these kind of artistic elements or features into, into um, structures and sites and thinking about kind of the end goal, right? The end goal is not just necessarily art for art's sake, but it's thinking about these kind of these elements are features that kind of enhance the aesthetics or the attractiveness of downtown or enrich the pedestrian environment. Like that's kind of the end goal. Um, and so maybe those are some things we can kind of put together in a letter um, that planning commission can send up to council as they're working on this. Does that sound good to the other members of the commission? And, and so chair, could you give us your, your plan for the letter? Yeah, I mean, I think my plan would be let's pass this motion. I don't even know if we need to include anything, but I think separately we can, I'm happy to take the lead and work with you and we can just write a letter to city council and give it to them on the 14th. Um, if, if I could, I would, uh, knowing that uh, Josh is on the uh, arts committee and uh, probably could have a discussion with the arts and we do have Cynthia here too, who is um, uh, you know, who has the experience with Actual Tree and who is part of the DLC that may be making this. May I make a suggestion that 
uh, maybe uh, the chair works uh, with the chair of the DLC and work uh, with uh, Vice Chair Freeman on the letter, I'm happy to contribute uh, as well. Sure, I don't want to uh, voluntold um, uh, Vice Chair Freeman well, or true. the chair of the DLC, so if either of them want to share any perspective on that, I would be welcome. Yeah, I'll be, I'd be happy to help uh, in any capacity I can, and I know the Vice Chair of the Arts Committee would help as well. Great. It was also me. Anything, uh, any any perspective from Cynthia? Um, yeah, I'd be fine to help. Just, great. That'd be great. That'd be much, much appreciated. Well, let's do that. Let's pass this motion with a recommendation that the Planning Commission work in partnership with the uh, DLC as well as member of the Arts Committee to draft a kind of a joint letter recommending to City Council that we think more about, uh, or that they think more about how we include more artistic elements or features that kind of enhance the attractiveness of downtown as this project moves forward. And, and one great website I found is americafortheartsorg I believe it is. And uh, uh, it's got a bunch of legal cases and a bunch of discussion on uh, these kind of topics. And actually, it, it goes way beyond uh, that as well. So uh, if you're looking to form an arts committee, if you're looking to form um, uh, public involvement to rabble-rouse your city to get them to recognize the arts it's got that kind of information on there it's it's kind of a neat little website if you're uh, into the arts or actually if you're into organizing any nonprofit as well great um well if there's no further discussion i'd entertain a motion this time i'll make sure it gets seconded i will make a motion to uh forward application za 2022-003 uh, forward to city council with the recommendation of including a higher uh, standard uh, for uh, contribution of artistic value. Great. We uh, uh, motion is on the floor. Is it? Is it? Chair, I would second the motion. The motion's been seconded by Vice Chair Freeman. Um, any further discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. The ayes have it. Uh, application ZA-2022-003 is approved um, and will now make its way on to Milwaukee City Council. Uh, this takes us on to our next order of business, item uh, 7.0, work session items, which we have none. We'll move forward to 8.0, uh, planning department, uh, commission other business updates. Any commissioners have any other items for discussion? Uh, I do. Is it, uh, is I have, it, I have is it an advertisement or is uh, well, it a... One's an advertisement, okay. one's a thank you, and one is uh, egg on my face. Let's start with egg on the face. Right. So uh, last time we were here, I made a diatribe on how important it was to our most vulnerable uh, residents in Milwaukee to bury our utility lines. Because I live in such a great city, I actually ran into the city engineer after the meeting, and he and I had a very nice half hour conversation because uh, our great staff is always willing to talk to, their res to our residents. And uh, he told me, well, for large scale projects, we do require that. So it kind of takes it out of uh, the hands of the planning department, but I do want to encourage the city with the CIP projects. Uh, every time that we have a project, let's bury those utility lines in uh, and let's figure out a way to get those utility lines down because without gas and with electric vehicles, we're going to strand our most vulnerable population in place without heat and without a way to uh, be able to find food. So that's number one. Number two, a quick thank you to Miss Kelly Brooks, who was our assistant uh, manager here in the city. 
Uh, she did an excellent job. She worked very well with the public. Uh, she is a transportation guru uh, by trade. Uh, and then she came here and really, I know, helped out uh, the manager, the city manager, Ms. Ober, very, very much with everything that uh, not only the residents, but city council required of, of uh, staffing. Um, she has moved on to the governor's uh, office. She may not be living in the uh, governor's mansion, but she certainly has an ear. Uh, in the transportation department, which I encourage our planning staff to use her as a resource um, so that when we go with the TSP and we have that friend, we have that great relationship to uh, right to be able to forge ahead. And lastly, Milwaukee Historical Society, along with his partners, the City of Milwaukee Lending Library and Willamette Falls Studios are proud to present the Letting Library Lecture Series. Join us Wednesday, February 1st, starting at 6 p.m. at the Letting Library for the volunteers. Come and explore the ins and outs, the good, the bad, and the successes of the experts that have shaped Milwaukee throughout the years. Our special guests include Volunteers of the Year 2021, Brandy Johnson, 2020, Hamid Bennett, 2018, Greg Himmer, 2017, Lisa gunyan Riker, 2016, Joel Bergman, and 2014, Alicia Hamilton. That is almost all of them. This exciting program is not only to encourage involvement within our city, but also answer questions you may have on how to become a volunteer. We also have a special presentation from Councilor Sevignon and a tribute to Ed Zomolt, which uh, the award is named after. If you cannot make it in person, join us on Zoom or watch later on Comcast Channel 30 or Milwaukee Heritage Channel on YouTube. For more information, visit Milwaukee History Museum on Facebook or the city calendar. Great. Thank you, Commissioner Hamer. Any other, uh, other business updates from members of the commission? Um, I, Two, maybe two questions. I, I figured, you, Laura, you might have um, a question that I kind of had is um, just understanding where we are with the transportation system plan process. Um, so I'd love to get an update on that. And the other thing I mentioned it um, uh, to some of the planning staff earlier, you know, I would kind of personally be interested in maybe trying to get the planning commission together either in person and or digitally for just maybe a little bit of a retreat or a work session at, at some point, um, you know, in the next few months. Um, we could notice it as a public meeting knowing we have quorum requirements, but mainly just get folks together to talk, see what, what folks are thinking, what questions they have. Welcome the city attorney to join us. Just, I know we've had some kind of you know, two groups of two or three kind of meetings, but I think it would also be nice, especially with new commissioners to just get us all together if we could for an hour or something like that on Yeah, if everybody's interested in doing that, we could work on an agenda together yeah. and try to find a date that would work and then get everybody together. Yeah. That'd be great. Keep seeing some heads shaking. Mm -hmm. Sounds yeah, sounds great. Okay. Great. Well, yeah, maybe we can just try and figure out figure out a day a day time for that and get that scheduled. Um How's the TSP coming along? TSP, at the moment, we finally got comments back from ODOT's procurement staff. Oof. That took a very, 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 very long time. And so um, we should be submitting it. We should be, they should be submitting it to DOJ sometime in the next couple of weeks. Okay. It could take two weeks it could take yeah. four months and and remind me this is tgm grant and does this still have a june 2024 the moves, the date, that, moves. The date moves back okay well that's a, at least positive that's yeah we don't have to cram more in the last time yes so, so that is the update um so okay. we're finally we're, we are hopefully getting it to doj so that's that's okay. good progress and then also the um tsp advisory committee appointments are being made on February 6th at the city council meeting. Okay. Are there recommendations that could be shared at this point or? Um, I don't have the list in front of me, okay. but yeah. Great. Any updates from the uh, planning staff for us? Yeah, I just wanted to let you all know that we have a new admin 
specialist who's now on the team. And so you'll start see, receiving um, messages from Petra Johnson. Okay. She's our new coordinator. Um, so she's been, we're really excited about having her. Can't wait to get her all up to speed. Um, so yeah, you'll start seeing stuff from her. Great. Forecast for future meetings, Forecast item for nine. Future meetings. Okay. There. February 14th, uh, Valentine's Day. We have the luck of being at the council and then coming to visit Planning Commission. It's just a day full of love. Um, so, hearing items <laughs> it's uh, code <laughs> amendments uh, for the climate friendly, equitable communities work that we've been doing with Ryan. And then, Vera, I think um, you all had a work session on the code fix housekeeping items last time. And so that's a coming through hearing. And then also, we've been working on our variance code updates, um, trying to understand when is the appropriate time to send people through a variance process, and maybe when isn't the appropriate time to send a, a folks to the variance process. And we've been having internal discussions through about that. So we're going to bring what we've been thinking to you all for discussion um, on the 14th as, in a work session. A whole lot of love there. <laughs> These are ones that are kind of low hanging fruit. Okay. These are not blowing up any big things. These are just ones that kind of we've all stumbled when the people have come in and had to request a variance. And we all thought, I think there was a collective kind of why are they coming to, the, to, to this group to ask for a variance? So those are the ones that we're talking about okay. discussing now. Yeah. Great. Yeah. That's it. That's it. Well, that takes us to the end of our agenda. Um, I will entertain uh, motions to adjourn. And since uh, Commissioner Losfeld isn't here, we I will make, end yeah. rapidly. Yeah, I'll, I'll uh, make a motion to like adjourn. 30, so. Yeah, I'll make a motion to adjourn. Second. All right. Uh, we're adjourned. Perfect. Thanks, everybody. Thank you all. Yeah.